Okay, so in this class I want to talk about another famous paradox in special relativity, and this is the twin paradox. Okay, so before I go in and tell you what the twin paradox is, I want to introduce it via a question on the worksheet. So this is worksheet 3, question 2. Okay, which says, a rocket travels to Mars and back at a constant speed of 10% the speed of light. So I've got the Earth here, got Mars somewhere over here, okay. and I have a rocket which travels to Mars and then comes back. Okay. And the question is basically about comparing the measurements of time, one of a clock which stays on the Earth the whole time, and one of a clock which is carried by the rocket. Okay? And we know that in special relativity we have this time dilation effect, so from the point of view of an Earth observer, the rocket clock is going to go slowly, and therefore when it comes back to Earth, it will measure less time than the Earth clock. Okay? And the question just asks you to calculate the difference in time between the two clocks. Okay, so some of the data is in the question. The distance from the Earth to Mars, well obviously it varies, but I've taken it to be 9 times 10 to the 10 meters. Okay, and the speed of the rocket V is 10% the speed of light, so that's 3 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Okay. So, the time taken to go do the whole journey, so that's to go from the Earth to Mars and back again. So we'll call this T. This is equal to distance divided by speed, right? So it's 2 times 9 times 10 to the 10 divided by 3 times 10 to the 7, and that works out to 6 times 10 to the 3. 6 times 10 to the 3 seconds. So that's a, about one and a half hours okay, for the rocket to go to the Mars and back. Okay? So this is the time as would be measured by a clock which is stationary on the Earth. So that's part A of the question. Part B of the question is asking you then, what is the difference in time measured between these two clocks? Okay? So we know that the rocket clock is time dilated, so therefore it measures less time, t prime, which is t times the square root 1 minus b squared over c squared. Okay, it's going to be a bit less, and therefore the difference in time between these two clocks, that's t minus t prime, this is t times 1 minus the square root 1 minus b squared over c squared. Okay? And then you just have to get a calculator and work that out. And that turns out to come out as 30 seconds. So after the round trip, after the rocket has come, gone to Mars and back, it will read 30 seconds less time than the clock on the Earth. Okay, so that's the end of that question. Well, there's a part C as well, which just asks you to consider the same thing with a higher velocity. Okay. So the higher the velocity, the less time it takes for the rocket to travel, but the larger the time dilation effect is. Okay. So it turns out that you end up measuring a greater time difference the faster you're going. That's part C of the question, which I won't do. Okay, so, so this example is directly related to the twin paradox, which is the thing I want to explain now. Okay, so I'm going to show this via a PPT. Yeah. Okay. So the situation is this. It's very similar to the one we've just done. You've got two twins, so two people with the same age. One, and they both live on Earth, but then one of them goes on a rocket and travels with a high speed, V, um, goes a certain distance at this speed, then he stops, reverses his velocity and comes back. Okay? And at the end of the journey, he is younger 
because his clock is ticking slower, so he will have experienced less time than the twin who stayed on Earth. Okay? So therefore, the twin who has gone off in this rocket journey will be younger than the twin who stayed on Earth. Okay? So that's exactly the same as the situation we've considered here. If we imagine that there's a twin on Earth and a twin on the rocket, then when the twin on the rocket comes back, we've, he will be 30 seconds younger. Okay. But obviously, if you, if you make this a large journey, a long journey, traveling at close to the speed of light, then you could be many years younger by the time you get back. Okay. So, what's the paradox? Okay. First of all, we can represent this on a space-time diagram as, as seen in the picture here. Okay. So, on the bottom, you've got the spatial direction. There's the Earth. Okay. So, one observer stays on the Earth, so he's represented as a vertical line on the space-time diagram. Okay. The observer in the rocket is moving, so he's a a line at an angle, and he goes out at a certain speed, away from the Earth, stops, turns around, and comes back at the same speed. Okay? And the final formula here, for the age difference, is exactly the same as the formula we've worked out here. Right? Time times 1 minus, and this factor here is 1 over the gamma factor. Okay? So this formula here for the age difference is the same as this one. Now, the paradox lies in the apparent symmetry between the two twins' perspectives. Okay? The perspective of the twin on the Earth okay, is this. He sees his twin in the rocket go out, then turn around and come back. Okay? From the perspective of the twin on the rocket, he sees the Earth go away. Right? So he sees the Earth go out and come back. So this situ situation looks symmetrical, right? It looks like both observers experience the same, or e experience equivalent things. The Earth observer sees the rocket go out and come back. The rocket observer says, sees the Earth go out and come back. But then if the situ situation is symmetrical, then how is it possible that one twin ends up younger than the other, which is an asymmetrical outcome, right? So this is the paradox. If the situation is symmetrical, then how can the result, the ages, end up not symmetrical? So the paradox has a simple resolution, which is that the situation is not really symmetrical. Okay? So the age difference between the twins is real. When the rocket twin comes back, he really is younger than the twin who stayed on the Earth. The reason the situation is not symmetrical is because only one of the observers has experienced acceleration. Okay? So in particular, the rocket observer experiences acceleration first when he starts his journey. He has to move away from the Earth. Then when he stops and turns around, he has to accelerate to turn around. And then when he gets back to the Earth, he has to accelerate in order to stop again. Okay? So the rocket observer experiences these periods of acceleration. The Earth observer, except for the gentle acceleration of the Earth around the Sun, experiences nothing. Okay. So the situation is not symmetrical. Only one observer experiences acceleration, and that's the rocket observer, and the Earth observer does not. Okay. So because the situation is, symm is not symmetrical, there's no, diff there's no reason why the result should be symmetrical. Okay. The experiences of the two observers are not the same, therefore it's no surprise that the results, the time they measure, is also not the same. So this is underlying an important point in special relativity, which I've mentioned before. The measurement of speed is relative, okay? and that's why it's called relativity theory, because of this, this point. Okay? Um, that means that if you've got two observers, you can ask what is the relative velocity between them, but you can't ask who is stationary, who is moving. That's just a matter of perspective, who is stationary, who is moving. But this is not true of acceleration. Okay? If you see two observers where they are relatively accelerating, okay, so the distance as a function of time has a non-constant first derivative, right? then the question of who is accelerating and who is not accelerating is an absolute question. Okay? That doesn't depend upon observer's perspective. Okay? Um, and and you, you know this, right? Because 
if you imagine doing this journey in a car, so instead of going out in a rocket, let's just drive in a car down to the shops and back. Okay? The, the observer who stayed in home feels nothing. The guy who got in his car and drove to the shops, when he starts up his car, he feels the force in his back of the acceleration as the car drives away. Again, when he stops, he has to brake and he feels himself being pulled forward. Okay? And the same is true in the reverse journey. So although velocity is a relative thing, okay? you can only talk about relative velocities, acceleration is an absolute thing. Okay? So in this particular example in the twin paradox, we can say absolutely that the twin in the rocket is accelerating, the twin on the Earth is not accelerating. This does not depend upon observer's perspective at all, therefore the situation is not symmetrical, and therefore um, at the end when they compare their clocks, there's no reason why the clocks should show the same time. Okay, so um, where we got to last time is we were talking about the twin paradox, okay, and the twin paradox is um, an example which is shown on the space-time diagram here. You have two twins, one of them stays on the Earth, the other one goes out in a rocket and comes back, and when he comes back, he is younger than his twin, okay, by the amount calculated here. T is the time of travel, 1 minus 1 over the gamma factor. Okay, so that's what we did last time, um, and I explained how this isn't really a, a contradiction in the theory, because although the situation may appear symmetrical, that means from the Earth's perspective and from the rocket's perspective, it's not really symmetrical because the rocket undergoes, undergoes acceleration and the Earth does not. Okay. So there's a, it's a false symmetry which underlies this paradox. Okay, um, so what I want to do in this class to begin with is a related example um, which, okay, so again you've got an astronaut goes out from Earth and comes back um, and they communicate with each other and I just want to use this example as an exercise in firstly using space-time diagrams and secondly calculating um, time dilation length contraction effects. Okay, so this is the, the problem. Okay. Uh, on New Year's Day 2016, an astronaut sets out from Earth at the speed of 0.8 times the speed of light and he travels to the nearest star which is about four light years away. So for light years, one light year is the distance light travels in one year, right? Okay. The four light years away is measured in the Earth frame of reference. So when he reaches the star, he immediately turns around and returns to Earth and arrives 10 years later. Okay, so there's obviously a misprint here. This should probably be 2006, and then he arrives 2016, right? So the journey takes 10 years. Let me change that right now. Let's do it that way. Okay. That's better. Okay. So he sets out 2006 and he comes back 2016. Okay. So we assume he's got a brother who remains on the Earth and then they send each other a signal once a year as measured in their own time frame. Okay. So that's the problem. Um, on the next slide, there is a, a space time diagram of this which I've given you a handout of. Okay, so if this isn't clear, you can look at your handout instead. Okay, so what you see here is space-time diagram, time plotted up here in years. Okay, here's the Earth, here's Alpha Centauri, the star he's traveling to. So this is his journey. He goes out for five years, reaches the star, and goes back. So this is the line of the, the astronaut. Okay, goes out, reaches the star, comes back. And then they send each other a signal once per year. Okay, so... From the point of view of the astronaut, he is traveling, right? He's moving and therefore his clock is going slowly. So you can work out the, the scale of the time dilation factor. We said his velocity is 0.8 times the speed of light, okay? So this means that gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.8 squared, okay? And this turns out to be 1 over 0.6. Okay, um, there's a nice relationship between these numbers. You, you know this triangle here. There's a right angle triangle where this is 5, this is 3, and this is 4, right? So if you divide each of these by 5, then you get a triangle 
where this is 1, this is 0 0.6, this is 0 0.8, okay? And therefore, 1 minus square root of 0 0.8 squared is 0 0.6, and vice versa, okay? So, um, often in kind of worksheet problems in special relativity, the speed is either 0 0.8c or 0 0.6c, and the reason is you get nice answers because of this prime, anyway. Okay, so gamma is 1 over 0 0.6, which is 5 over 3. Okay? So what does this mean in terms of the time dilation effect? So if we look, say, at the outward journey here, that takes five years, as measured in the Earth frame. So the time it takes measured in the rocket frame, the astronaut frame, is going to be five times um, 1 over gamma. Right, that's the time dilation factor. Okay? So that's 5 times 3 over 5, which is 3. So I told you I pick numbers where the, the answers come out nice. So that means if the Earth twin measures a time of 5 years, then the twin in the rocket will measure a time of 3 years. Okay? So 3 years going out and 3 years coming back. So these blue dots here on the diagram are the years as measured by the guy in the rocket, right? One year, two year, three years, four years, five years, six years. So the Earth twin thinks it takes ten years, the rocket twin thinks it takes six years. Okay, so there's a four year difference when they get back. <coughs> right, what's next? Okay, um, there's the Earth years. Right, so I said they send each other a signal once per year as measured in their by their clocks. So the Earth observer hears each year, and each year he sends a signal which travels at the speed of light. So that's a 45 degree line on the space-time diagram. So these orange lines are the signals of the Earth twin. And likewise, the rocket twin sends signals back to the Earth, which look like this in his years. So when he measures a year, he sends a signal back. Okay? So I want to do some calculations related to this picture. That's the end of the diagram. But I want to do some calculations to show you how it works. So the first thing to notice is that the first signal here reaches the rocket observer after three of his years. Right? So when the rocket observer measures three years, he gets the first signal from Earth. And the same is true of the Earth observer. When the Earth observer measures three years, he gets the first signal from the rocket. Right? Now those two must be the same, because until this point, the situation really is symmetrical. Right? They are just going away at constant velocity. So until this point, whatever is true of the rocket observer must also be true of the Earth observer, because it is symmetrical. But after this point, the rocket observer goes as acceleration, after this point, it's no longer symmetrical. Right. And again, you can see this because as soon as the rocket observer turns around, he now gets three signals per year. Right? These orange lines, one, two, three. Okay? Three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So in the first three years going out, he gets one signal. But as soon as he turns around, he gets two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So ten signals in total corresponding to the ten years measured by the Earth's observer. Differently, the Earth observer gets one signal every three years right until the last year. Okay? So he gets a signal after three years, after six years, after nine years. Right? And then in the last year only, he gets three signals. So this is the asymmetry, right? Up until, as I say, up until this point, the situation is symmetrical. One signal in three years, one signal in three years. But when he turns around, that breaks the symmetry. Right, so I want to calculate, I want to show to you really that this diagram is accurate. So in other words, prove that this signal reaches the rocket after three years, and the same here. Prove that after that they get one signal every third of a year. Okay. So I'll do those calculations now.
Okay, so the first thing I'll do is I'll calculate this point here. So when does the first signal from Earth reach the rocket observer? Um, so I'm going to write down an equation for this, right? So, so let's say it reaches the rocket at time t1, and I'm going to write down an equation for t1. Okay. So the way I do it is that the distance the rocket has traveled is just v times t1. That's the distance the rocket has traveled. And the distance the light has traveled is equal to c times t1 minus 1. Right? Minus 1 because the light goes one year after the rocket. Right? The first signal of the light leaves the Earth one year after the rocket has left the Earth. Okay? So at the point that these two lines meet, this point here, this point here, the distance covered by the rocket and the distance covered by the light signal are the same. Right? This is the distance covered by the rocket, this is the distance covered by the light signal. Okay, so this means that 0.8 times T1 is equal to T1 minus 1, which means 0.2 T1 equals 1, which means that T1 equals 5. As I said, right? So I, I wasn't lying about that. Okay? And as measured by the rocket observer, because of the time dilation factor, this is three years as measured by the rocket. So as measured by the rocket, the time T1 prime is three years. Five years is the time measured by the Earth observer. Yeah, okay. So in, in the notation I'll use, I'll put primes on the measurements of the rocket observer. Okay? So if there's a prime, that means it's measured by the rocket observer. If there's no prime, that means it's measured by the Earth observer. Okay? So that's the first signal. So next we'll do the, the second signal. Okay? I won't do them all because it will take too long, right? I'm just going to do a few just to show enough of the detail. The second signal from Earth, which is rocket time T2. Okay? So again, we'll write down an equation for T2 based upon the distance the rocket has traveled. Okay? So the first thing is, First thing to note is that T2 is going to be more than 5, right? Because T1 was 5, so it's going to be more than 5. But after 5 years, the rocket has turned back, right? So therefore, the rocket is now moving back towards the Earth. So we need to take account of this when we calculate the distance of the rocket. Right? So we write down an equation in the same way. The distance of the rocket is the total distance he's traveled, which is four light years, minus the distance he's come back. Right? And the distance he's come back is v times t2 minus 5. Right? Four light years is the total distance to the star. He turns back from the star after five years. So the distance he's come back is his velocity times t2 minus 5. That is, that's the position of the rocket. And again, the position of the light is c times t2 minus 2. Because the light leaves two years after the rocket. The second signal leaves two years after the rocket. Okay. 
Okay, and again, you just have to solve this equation to find T2. So you get 4 minus 0 0.8 times T minus 5 equals T2 minus 5 equals T2 minus 2. Okay, um, I should say here, maybe if it's confusing, look at the units we're using, right? We're measuring time in years. Right? And we're measuring distance x in light years. Now a consequence of this choice of units is that the speed of light is one light year per year. Right? That's the definition of a light year, is that it's the distance light travels in one year. So therefore the speed of light in these units is just one. So in these units, the speed of light is 1. So that's why I can just write 1 here, and 0.8 there. Okay, so let's put everything together. So on this side, I've got 4, and that's another 4, plus 2 is 10. So I get 10 is equal to T2 plus 0.8 T2, so 1.8 T2. Okay, so look, uh, look over here. So therefore, T2 is 10 divided by 1.8, so that's 50 divided by 9, uh, so that's 5 plus 5 ninths of a year. Okay. So it takes 5 ninths of a year for the signal to reach it, right? T2 minus T1 is 5 ninths. Okay. Of a year. Okay? So again, let's work this out for the rocket observer. Okay? So then you get T2 prime minus T1 prime. This is 5 ninths. Uh, divided by gamma times 1 over gamma, right? time dilation. So this is 5 ninths and 1 over gamma was 3 fifths. Okay. So therefore this is equal to 1 third. Right? 3 ninths is a third. Okay. Um, and that's the, the second thing I, I said. So if you look on this diagram, over here. So the first signal reaches him after five years or three years measured in his time frame, and the next signal reaches him after a third of a year measured in his time frame. Okay, so I, I've proved to you now this point here and this point here. Okay, so, so you can calculate all of the other points here and here and here and here and here in a similar way, but actually you don't have to. Right? The reason you don't have to is once you've calculated this point and this point, you can work everything out just using the symmetry of the situation as follows. So because this situation until here is symmetrical, as I said, if this first signal reaches the rocket after three years, then this signal must reach the Earth after three years. Right? So this distance is three years. But this line, the second rocket signal, is parallel to the first. So if this distance is three years, then this distance must also be three years, and this distance must also be three years. Right? So that completes up to here. And then the second light signal, we've proved this distance here is a third of a year. And again, the third signal is parallel to the second. So if this is a third, then this must be a third, this must be a third, 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 third. third. Again, by symmetry. And finally, when the earth rocket is moving back to the Earth, again, the situation here is symmetrical with the situation here. Right? So if the rocket observer is getting three signals in a year, then the Earth observer must also get three signals in a year. Yeah. Okay. So, so that, those two calculations are, and some arguments about symmetry are enough to complete this diagram here. Right, so that's the end of that problem. I chose to do this for two reasons. The first is that it clearly demonstrates where the asymmetry happens. As I said, up until this point, it's symmetrical, 
but as soon as you turn around, you get an asymmetry. Right? As soon as you turn around, the rocket gets three signals a year, but that's not true of the Earth until right at the very end. Right? So it is a non-symmetrical situation. The second thing, the second reason I, I did this example is what I want to talk about now. Okay? You notice that the signal is sent out once a year. Okay? But because he's moving away from the Earth, he receives the signal once every three years. Right? So the signal is slowed down by a factor of three. Once he turns around and goes back towards the Earth, the, sp the signal is sped up, gets faster by a factor of three. Right? So this effect uh, is known as the Doppler effect. And we've actually seen it once before, right at the very start of this course, um, when we were talking about the measurement of the speed of light using the eclipses of Io. Right? And what we said is, Io's eclipse happens at a certain period of time, at a certain time period, but when the Earth is moving away, it appears to be slower, and when the Earth is moving towards, it appears to be faster. Right? That's exactly the same effect as happens here. Right? When you're moving away, the signal looks slower, when you're moving towards, the signal looks faster. Okay? So this is the Doppler effect, and I want to derive a general equation for this effect. So how much is the frequency of the signal shifted based upon the velocity of the source of the signal? 